welcome to Continual, and this is the Holiday Romance Track. We're back with more wonderful holiday and winter romance by some of your favorite authors. So tonight, before we get started, I want to ask uh, our author panelists to introduce themselves. Kim, let's start with you. Hi there, I'm Kim Fielding, and I write primarily male-male romance in, I think, all the genres. <laughs> Great. Lucy? Hi, I am Lucy Blue, and I write romance, uh, some horror romance, some historical romance, some cozy mystery romance, and I am also the uh, goddess for Falstaff Crush, which is the romance line from Falstaff Books out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And Crimson. I am Crimson Hart, and I write romance in paranormal, fantasy, sci-fi, male-male, male-female, a little bit of everything. Um, <laughs> And if it's out there, I've probably written it. Cool. Alexandra? I'm Alexandra Christian, and I write um, paranormal and contemporary romance. I dabble a little bit in horror every now and then. And I'm also Lucy's sister. So there you go. <laughs> That's me. But don't hold it against her. No, <laughs> no try not to. <laughs> I'm Gail Z. Martin and Morgan Bryce. As Gail, I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, steampunk, and more. As Morgan, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. So um, I, I get to play, play in the sandbox too. <laughs> All right, folks, what holiday romances have you written or do you have coming up for this season? And Lex, I'm going to start with you. Oh my God, I knew you were going to start with me. Okay, so <laughs> like... Evil like the that. only the only exclusively holiday romances that I've written were these terrible erotic shorts that I wrote a couple of years ago. Erotic yes, short... terrible no. Oh well, they well okay. They were based they were based on like the titles of Christmas songs, <laughs> and one of them was and I wrote them under a pseudonym, Figgy Pudding. Figgy Pudding was my pseudonym, oh. and um, so one of them was called oh come all ye faithful and it was about a christmas party that turned into an orgy and then there was another one that was called from the realms of glory and it's about this guy who is alone on christmas and so he goes to this club that has glory holes and he discovers where they are and those are the only two that i've actually <laughs> written I have one in progress right now that is almost as far away from that as you can get. And God willing, it will come out maybe by next Christmas. I don't know. But it's, I mean, it's total Hallmark Channel movie. Like the guy owns a Christmas tree farm. That's what, that's where we are. So um, yeah, that's, that's my experience. I was going to say, well, we asked, yeah, usually um gosh i have yeah oh she might be frozen no actually you're frozen right time for the holidays yeah. um uh, lucy until we get crimson back oh crimson's back oh, crimson's back I'm frozen. Oh, okay. yeah yeah um okay. yeah so i have actually written um a holly romance about krampus where krampus is the main character and he's pansexual so he's pretty much you know doing it with everybody in every incarnation. So he saves Santa, he saves Jack Frost, he saves, you know, the incarnation of night and basically just saves the world and has fun doing it. Um, just because it's fun, because usually, you know, Krampus is seen as eating children, but this time he actually saves the world. Um, I've also written a paranormal romance um, about the winter solstice uh, way back in the day about a woman moves into this house, it's haunted, and she ends up finding out that um, the local um, Native American tribe are werewolves and they have part of the, you know, the land is sacred and there's a ghost in the house and, you know, it all comes together in the winter solstice. Okay, yes. L Lucy. I have never written a full length holiday romance, but I have three very different short holiday romances that are included in other things. For example, in Eat the Peach, which is a series of witchy short stories. They're all short stories featuring witch heroines. Um, one of them is called Midwinter, and it is also a solstice story, but it is an ancient solstice story. It's basically about how Merlin's parents hooked up. Um, 
it is a love story between a Wiccan, for right, lack of a better word, though it's not. Wiccans would call me out big time for mistakes and details, I'm sure. But, um, but a priestess and the guy who was her summer king back when she got pregnant. And instead of having a, a little girl, she had a little boy. And it's almost the winter solstice. And she discovers that her little boy has the beginnings of horns growing under his curls, which means that he is going to be an incarnation of the horned god. And uh, it's basically how they deal with that. It's a short story about that. Um, very, very different from that. Uh, speaking of Krampus, is in Bury Me Not. It's called Cowboys and Krampus. And um, those are weird Western comic romances about an outlaw named Albert Cade and Daisy, the saloon girl that helps him fight off zombies in the first story. Um, by Cowboys and Krampus, they are a couple and they are snowed in at this inn in the middle of the Lone Prairie for Christmas. And there's a little boy there, the innkeeper's son, and they're telling him that Krampus is going to come get him. And she basically tells him not to worry, kid. If Krampus comes to get anybody, he's going to come get Elbert. Don't worry. But of course, Krampus does show up and they have to save the kid from Krampus. Uh, and then finally, my major focus right now is a series of comic mysteries set in the 1920s, romantic mysteries uh, featuring... Stella Hart, who is a silent movie actress who solves murders on the side. And as an add-on on the latest one that's out, there is a Christmas story called Guinevere's Christmas. Guinevere is the little dog who helps her solve the first murder. And in Guinevere's Christmas, she and her beloved George go home to the manor house and, for Christmas, and Guinevere once again saves the day. Um, so lots and lots of Christmas stuff. Cool. And Kim? I find holiday stories really irresistible, so I, I have one probably every year for the last, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years. Nice. So this year I had I had two, actually, and one of them was a solstice story, which seems to be a theme. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a solstice story that's set in um, modern day. It, it uses the, the Summer King, Winter King mythology, and there's a mm -hmm. vampire because who doesn't need be. a vampire? Right. And it's called the Solstice, solstice Kings. Um, and the other one is um, just came out actually, and it's called Carold, and it's set in uh, 1942 in San Francisco. It's part of my bureau series, which is a paranormal noir sort of investigation series. Nice. Um, but you can you can read them all separately. So this one has has a, a one of the investigators is a son, son of a human and an angel, and his lover is a demon who he rescued and they go to San Francisco and there's monsters and it's Christmas. So. <laughs> nice. And uh, I've got three. I've got Lucky Town, which is set in my Badlands series. So that's a um, psychic medium and his homicide detective boyfriend who go back to his boyfriend's hometown in Pittsburgh and meet his huge Italian family. And so we get some insights into the characters there. And then of course, there is a supernatural killer and, and that killer kind of follows them back to Myrtle Beach. So you can't have Christmas without murder and mayhem. <laughs> uh, Dark Rivers is um, in the Witchbane series. Oddly enough, it's also set in Pittsburgh, uh, although the series itself is not. And I wouldn't say it's, t it, it is a story that occurs at Christmas as opposed to being a Christmas story, but Christmas does affect the plot and in the end there's a really lovely found family scene and and scenario where everybody's helping each other out and and taking care of the um, halfway house that the um, ex-priest character in the in the book runs and it's then like the uh, die hard of, of morgan bryce books right it is it, it kind of <laughs> is without nakatomi tower right. um, <laughs> but uh and and then there's um Christmas at Canem Castle, which is uh, an anthology with seven different romance authors, and uh, it's all set in the same fictional castle at the same fictional ball, and hijinks ensue. So, 
at, kind of coming at it from several different ways. What is it about Christmas stories that just grabs us and won't let us go? Why do we keep coming back to these? Why do readers love them? Um, and what are some of the tropes that you love in Christmas stories? Crimson? Well, I think that like for me, you know, you, when you read something about Christmas or watch a Christmas movie, you know, you expect the warmth to be there and everyone kind of getting along. And then you have the, you know, the, the, oh my God, you know, uh, what's going to happen and all, all the craziness that ensues with that. And then they have to like fix the problem and get back together and there's ice skating and hot chocolate and, <laughs> and making snowmen. And um, so I guess that's just what I like best is really just the, the togetherness of the season and just, you know, kind of puts you in the mood for Christmas. Okay. Lucy? Um, Happily Ever After works great in a Christmas setting. Yeah. You know, it just feels natural. You're already psyched for that. You're already expecting that. And also, for me, it's a way to show my characters being a little warm and fuzzier than I ordinarily would. Like, for example, in the Western story, I mean, these are battling lovers, okay? And in Cowboys and Krampus, they continue to be battling lovers. But in the process of this Christmas story, she ends up accidentally confiding to him an incident from her childhood that has kind of made her into the hard case that she is now. And the way that he responds to that is, it's not out of character for him, but it's, it's a bigger step than you would, than, than would feel natural in a story that wasn't a Christmas story. And so that kind of moves their relationship forward in a way that feels natural um, to the characters, but it's really, really sweet. And these characters don't get to be sweet very often. And so, yeah, that's what I love about it. One thing I think is that with Christmas stories, you can get away with inserting a little bit of magic, even if what you're writing is a contemporary or a historical or something. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think readers give you a little bit more leeway for kind of stretching the boundaries of reality yes. when it's a Christmas story. So um, a couple of years ago, I wrote, um, I was one of seven authors who wrote a, a, a series of books of the Christmas Angel series, and, and they're all historical. It was, yeah, they were so much fun. And they were, you know, they're historicals. And mine was set in in New York in, in, in the 1880s. And I spent a lot of time researching it. And it was, you know, it was very careful, historical, but there's an angel, you know, and you can, <laughs> you can get away with just that little, little bit of, of, of sparkle, I guess. Great. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that what, whether you had ideal Christmases as a child or whether you just wished you had ideal Christmases, Christmas stories kind of bring all that magic back together again. And, and they give you a chance to have some of that ideal Christmas um, regardless. And I think it's also about family, which can also be found family. So maybe it's people you're really related to, maybe it's people you choose as your family, but it's it's really all about the importance of family and family having your back and, and having everybody together. Um, and like Kim said, a little bit of magic always welcome. You can fit in those things that uh, you might not get away with in a, you know, a regular contemporary. There's just sparkles, there's candles, there's trees, there's decorations. I mean, what's not, and food, don't forget the food. What's not to love? Um, and as far as some of the tropes go, I mean, I'm a sucker for fake boyfriend. We've got all the parties and everything where people need to show up with somebody on their arms. So fake boyfriend is, is great for that. Uh, whether it's New Year's Eve or Christmas dinner. I love the forced proximity. So snowing people in at a cabin or, you know, a rest stop or wherever it is. Um, and then they're either going to end up kissing or killing each other. All good. <laughs> um, so those are some of my favorites uh, is just, you know, getting those people, arranging to put those people in that situation, a little bit of Christmas magic. What are some of the Christmas books that you've read, and they can be romance or not, um, over the years that have stuck with you. Maybe there's something you read every year. Maybe it's something you read to kids. Maybe it's something you were read to, or maybe it's a romance that you've discovered. You just gotta, you either think about it every year, you come back to it, or it inspired you. Uh, Lucy. Oh, I'll start because mine is the cliche. 
it's a Christmas Carol. I read a Christmas Carol the first time when I was about eight or nine years old. And I remember when I got to the end, you know, the happy ending, Scrooge reforms, uh, it's all the ghost did it all in one night. I was hysterical with grief. My mother could not figure out what in the world was wrong with me. I said, mama, he wasted all that time. He's an old man now. And he lost everything because he was so mean and so stupid. You know, and she's like, yeah, but for the rest of his life, it's going to be better. And so, you know, at that time, I thought, I am never reading this stupid thing again. I don't know why in the world people like it. But year after year after year, I come back to it. And um, Lex can back me up on this. Our dad was a huge fan of George C. Scott. Like most old curmudgeonly dads, he loved Patton. And uh, the George C. Scott miniseries version of A Christmas Carol was one of his absolute favorites. And so our family every year always watch that and i'm sure we will this year too um but i have i own the book and i read it every year and it, it means something different to me every time i read it and now that i am myself 56 years old and i don't like to think that oh you know if i suddenly wised up tomorrow well my life is over what's the point no i don't feel that way at all <laughs> so uh yeah, it gets better for me every year. How about you, Kim? I was actually going to say the same exact book. <laughs> you know, I mean, the thing about the Christmas Carol is, is it's, 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 it's kind of a timeless story. I mean, think about all the adaptations that there have been. I mean, I like the Muppets version, you know, and mm -hmm. there's, it, it works no matter no matter where people put it. If people can just can just relate to that kind of story of redemption. And last year, actually, I wrote a, a gay romance version of a Christmas Carol told from the the point of view of of one of the one of the ghosts. And and it's just it's it's a story that you know we, it, you can do so much with. And and so and and it's beautifully written. I mean, and it's it's funny. It's clever. I mean, I hadn't. Last year, I went back and reread it for the first time in a while, and the language is is wonderful. And Gorgeous. and even after all these years, it still resonates. Mm -hmm. Alexandra, um, my, one of my and this was actually one of my favorite books as a kid. Anyway, I would read it even if it wasn't Christmas. It was um, it's a book called The Best Christmas Pageant Ever, and um, I love that story. I don't know if it's because I have a thing for kids that are bad or what, I don't know. But I thought that that book was absolutely hilarious when I was a kid. And when I became, when I was a second grade teacher, I used to read it every single year. Um, and it, it reading it out loud is even more fun than, um, than reading it to yourself. Um, because there's just so many lines in it. They're just hilarious. Um, and, I don't know. I didn't really identify with the Herdmans. Um, in case you don't know the story, it's about these really bad kids who um, get involved with a Christmas pageant because they were bullying a kid and they end up getting pushed, pulled into the Christmas pageant completely by accident. And through doing the Christmas pageant, they, you know, have their own little, you know, epiphany about not being horrible. But they're still, I mean, they're still mischievous and everything, but you see that they you know, deep down that they are good kids. And, um, and I think that's a good message that, you know, kids, even the kids that are the bad kids, you know, they, they're still kids deep down in, deep down inside. So um, that is, that's always my favorite. And I used to read, I used to read it every single year when I was a teacher and I haven't read it in a while um, because, you know, I'm a 43 year old woman. Why would I continue to read this little tiny children's novella? Because it's but, good. It mm -hmm. is good. It is good. And I did get the chance to be in the play. There is a play version of it. Um, and I actually got to play the mom. <laughs> in the poor that, soul um, directing the Christmas pageant. And she yes, was awesome, I was by the, the poor way. soul directing the Christmas pageant. Um, so, yeah, it was interesting. But I love that book. It's my favorite. Crimson? I'd have to say The Grinch. <laughs> I love that too. You know, I it's just a great story and it's classic and I have to say I'm more prone to like the movie adaptations than the actual book but you know it's still it's one of my favorites. I think on the romance side of things um, I love the Christmas Angel series uh, which Kim was part of and I think that's actually how I discovered you 
um, as a reader. Uh, and, and there is this carved Christmas angel and it comes down through the years and it seems to find the person who needs it to change their life. And then it goes on its way and finds the next person in another time period. And it, they're just so well written. I'm a sucker for the Vale Valley books, which is a shared universe set in a lovely little town where anything can happen. And uh, there have been numerous years of multi-author uh, Christmas and holiday editions there. And I, I just, you know, I'm a sucker for that. And on the non-romance side, um, there's a book called How Murray Saved Christmas. And it is about- I love that book. <laughs> yes. It is the most non-traditional Christmas book. This elf who screws everything up manages to knock Santa out with this boxing glove toy that now <laughs> Yes. Now Santa AO you probably concussed. And what are you gonna do with the sleigh? And he finds the only person he can find at midnight on Christmas, which is Murray, who runs the all-night holiday diner, and says, I need to I I, I need somebody to drive the sleigh. So it's not Murray's problem. It's not even his holiday, but he says, sure kid, come on in. We'll, we'll get the, the presents out to everybody. And they break all the rules on the way. And they, they don't just <laughs> give them to the good kids. They give them to the mischievous kids and the kids who tried hard, but just didn't make it anyhow. And everybody has a great Christmas because, you know, they, they get <laughs> everybody and Santa does eventually wake up and can focus his eyes again. And it all turns out. Okay. But it's just hysterical. And his name's for the reindeer, like yeah. Trixie. <laughs> Because <laughs> he can't remember any of their names. I love There's, that book. I used to read it to my kids every year. To the adults. Um, yeah. So that one's a fun one. How about those? Now we talked a little bit about movies and specials, but you know it's Christmas, so there's so many more. What are some of your favorite holiday movies, TV shows, Hallmark movies, holiday specials? You know, uh, so much to choose from. Alexandra? Um, well, I mean... I like Hallmark Channel movies. I, I mean, the Hallmark Channel Christmas movies, I do. I could not tell you one in particular because let's face it, ladies, they have pretty much the same plot. I mean, they're all kind of similar. So I can't, I have a hard time remembering the names, but I do like Hallmark Channel movies. I think that um, they're good to put you in the holiday spirit. And they're always, I mean, they're very, they're very low stakes. There's, it's something that you can sit there and watch while you're making Christmas cookies or wrapping presents or whatever and, you know, and enjoy it, but you don't have to think too much about it. And I think that's part of their appeal, you know. Um, my favorite Christmas movie is A Christmas Story, most definitely. Um, <laughs> it's just a movie that I started watching when I was a kid and it has everything that little kids, lo I mean, you know, they say dirty words and you know there's like poop jokes and the kid gets his tongue stuck to a pole and i mean you know these are things that kids love but because i loved it so much when i was a kid i've continued watching it and we watch it every year in fact we do the whole you know loop it on christmas eve and jail hate excuse me lucy hates that movie so I don't hate that movie <laughs> I hate watching that movie three times in succession I know. <laughs> well you never get to see it when you watch it on the loop thing you never you always start in a different place so you have to watch it to the end and then watch it to where you caught up see that's where you that's where you go wrong every time you know listen, listen, that movie <laughs> I, I, I could do without pretty much all of that movie, but every year I have to see Ralphie beat the ever-loving heck out of Scott Farkas <laughs> one time, at least. My year is not complete if Scott Farkas doesn't get his at least one time. Yes, yes, you have to, you have to, you have to let that happen. Um, and as far as holiday TV, okay, anybody that knows me very well will tell you that I, I am obsessed with watching reruns of Frasier. Like I am I am now about Frasier the way I used to be about the Golden Girls. Um, <laughs> and the Christmas episodes of Frasier are really hilarious. My favorite one, well, I have two favorite ones. There's one that's called Perspectives on Christmas. And it's about, it's the same Christmas holiday weekend, but it's each character, each main character's perspective on what happened and it's really funny but then there's one called high holidays where they accidentally get the father um high on hash brownies and it's oh my god it's just it's just so funny you, if you have amazon prime go 
turn it on, watch it. It's called High Holidays. It's like in like the seventh or eighth season. I guarantee you'll feel better about whatever ails you. <laughs> Crimson. Um, I like to watch It's a Wonderful Life. Um, just it's a staple. You know, I used to watch it with my grandparents, and you know, so I've just kind of kept watching it. Um, honestly, also like The Sound of Music. It's not really a Christmas movie, but we they would just watch it at Christmas. Right? Yeah, yeah they, they always showed it at Christmas. Christmas, so we we would watch that too. So in terms of movies, um, I'm not really much into the holiday romance movies, but I like them if they're on. Um. In terms of Christmas shows, it's really silly. I like the holiday, like, baking championships. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I like to see what they make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can live vicariously through other people's cookies. Yes, you know? yes, because there's no way I can bake anything. <laughs> How about you, Lucy? Um, I'm not a huge fan of holiday romance movies, like Hallmark movies, for... The very reason that a lot of people like them, which is the familiarity. It it is, you know, it it's two attractive people. Thank heavens they're not always two attractive white people of opposite traditional genders anymore. But it's two attractive people who have jobs that everyone would love to have that no one could make a living at. <laughs> you know, meeting and you know, you know, they meet in the first ten minutes and don't like each other. Oh, really? Really? Gosh, wonder if they'll get together by the end. And you know, as a romance author, it is absolutely ridiculous for me to criticize anything on these grounds. But I think that because they show so many of them, again, like with the Christmas story, back to back to back to back, I, you, know, you can fall asleep in the middle of one and wake up in the middle of the next one and you know, with no discernible... You know, and. I don't like that. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that I am a non-traditional Christmas movie fan because one of my absolute favorites is Love Actually, which can't, th there's a case to be made for Love Actually is Hallmark Christmas movies cut and pasted together with English actors in it. I mean, you know, it, it again, it's that same kind of thing. Um, but but they don't all have happy endings. Well, that's true. They don't. They don't. Um, and, you know, I, I wish they did, you know, every time I, I watch it. Um, but, but I really love that one. Um, love Christmas episodes of pretty much any television show that I like. I used to love the Christmas episodes of MASH, so they always made me cry. Um, there is an episode of the Vicar of Dibley where the poor vicar is trying to put on the you know progressive Christmas pageant live nativity thing and, and of course things you know. um I am an absolute sucker for any story like that one is where ev absolutely everything goes wrong and best Christmas pageant ever is like this too. Absolutely everything goes wrong. There's absolutely no reason to believe that these people are going to succeed in the quest before them. And yet somehow, because it's Christmas, it all comes together and it's even better than anyone could possibly have imagined it would be. And you know, there are endless variations of that story and I love them all. So. How about you, Kim? I have a, a <laughs> sort of a morbid streak. So um, for me, The Nightmare Before Christmas, which you can argue whether it's Christmas or, or Halloween, but it might as well be both. So that's it's I, both. Yeah. I mean, the animation, the songs, the whole thing. I just, I, I'm, I, I oh, always it's awesome. Have, yeah. And I like, I like, um, I like It's a Wonderful Life because it is so dark and so bleak. <laughs> and so, I mean, it is so horrible. Oh, it's a map of man's suicide. <laughs> <laughs> nothing goes right for him other than i mean he's got the wife and kids that's nice but other than that i mean just time after time all of his hopes are just destroyed and and i mean clarence is cute and all of that but but i i guess i like the darkness with a happy ending which is which is a nice thing and then um every now and then i like to watch those really old tv specials that were on when i was a kid you know like like rudolph the red-nosed reindeer oh, and those, yeah. you know, the, those yeah. animated ones with the, with the brown rinkin and bass was it was it yeah yeah, yeah. and, and, the, yeah, and the, those were those were so much fun <laughs> yeah i mean i love home alone 
because who doesn't like to see a kid whose parents totally forgot to take him with them <laughs> on Christmas <laughs> yeah. and don't notice. Okay. Uh, I love how he whoops the, you know, the wet bandits butts and, and talk about morbid. I mean, that kid's kind of sadistic, but yeah. it's so fun to watch. Um, so I, I love the Home Alone movies and uh, Die Hard is totally a Christmas movie. Oh yeah. And, yeah, just totally. And I love the Christmas specials like Kim was talking about, uh, especially some of the ones that are maybe a little more obscure than Rudolph, than like, you know, the year without a Santa Claus or Santa Claus is coming to town. And the, the funny story on that is for a long, long time, before they all came out individually on um, DVD, which is fairly recent, we had this precious VHS tape that had been taped off of Showtime in like the 80s and it still had the commercials for Teddy Ruxpin and so nice. every year we would play the sacred VHS tape for the kids awesome. and then I made my husband burn it to DVD in case the date broke because it was getting up in years and then they finally brought all of the um all the specials out on their own DVDs and we no longer get to hear about Teddy Ruxpin but it was well, but now you don't have the commercials and the commercials were so brilliantly 80s, you know. Yes, they were. <laughs> yes, they were. Now, I, um, if, you, uh, if you've ever, I don't know if anybody's ever taught school or substitute taught or whatever, at Christmas at school, the object of the game is to keep the children as quiet and entertained as possible. So you have to find, like, a, they played Christmas movies continuously for the last week of school before Christmas vacation. I saw some of the scariest Rankin and Bass things so what's the one with the kids with the with the kids inside the clock or something it was very strange and they had oh. to fix the clock so that santa would know to stop or something it's the oh, night before christmas it's for christmas it's, yeah with yes. the mouse oh my god yeah, yeah. well in in uh santa claus is coming to town you've got the burger meister meister burger who yes. the yeah. off the who had the best <laughs> song i love that song yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, in year without a Santa Claus, you've got Heatmeister and and Coldmeister, and they're yeah, they're and kind the, of tricky. And the second graders are coming up and asking me, they're like, "What is going on in this week?" I'm like, "I have no idea. Just let art wash over you." <laughs> <laughs> there's this one scene in the um, Santa Claus is Coming to Town where Jessica gets this epiphany about what what Christmas really means, and she gets this whole trippy psychedelic 70s song <laughs> moment <laughs> <You're just laughs> it, it's just so incredibly 70s it's, it's really kind of beautiful oh my gosh They're, those things are terrifying but i always found those little the little claymation things mm -hmm. i always found those terrifying anyway i was afraid of the california races <laughs> <laughs> she was well, oh and the other episode you guys mentioned episodes of, of shows obviously a very supernatural Christmas, which is the Christmas episode for Supernatural. And, and Kim, you talk about macabre, you know, this guy's going to hell and it's his last Christmas on earth. So let's, let's celebrate. Oh but, my God. Uh, yeah. What about, uh, you know, what are, what are your favorite things to cook, to bake? What, what are your holiday traditions or maybe for decorating? Come on, let us in on your, on your, your favorite. <laughs> Kim? So my family primarily celebrates Hanukkah. So we do, so for me, I mean, big time it's potato latkes and Yum. I'm delighted to say that my older daughter not only enjoys making them, but makes them better than I do. Nice. And cause they're kind of a pain. You've got to grate the potatoes and it makes a mess all over. The, and she makes really good latkes. So, so that's probably one of my favorite. And actually Hanukkah is a celebration of all fried foods, which is I think something we can all get on top of. Um, so so that's good and we're kind of a baking family so uh, we end up doing a lot of, of baking over over the holidays so for me that's always a, a highlight we don't do a lot of decoration we save our decoration energies for primarily for halloween i think it's I don't, we live in california and the winter holidays in california are kind of eh. 
I mean, like people are trying to convince themselves it's winter, but it's still 65 degrees outside and it just, it just doesn't work for me. So, so we, we, we stick to the, we stick to the food, which, you know, why not? Oh, and we have a family tradition of every year, the, my kids make um, peppermint bark. And when they were littler, they would bring it up to all their teachers and all the, all the school administrators. And I'm sad because my younger daughter is a, is a, she's not in school in person anyway this year and she's a high school senior. So this, this would have been the last, the last peppermint bark year, you know? So I've, 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 that's kind of a tradition that I'm, I'm gonna be sad about for a while. Lucy? Well, um, Kim was talking about being 65 degrees at Christmas. My husband is Australian. So he was used to going swimming on Christmas Day. That's what you did on Christmas Day was you opened your presents, you went swimming. Uh, so if it were up to me, I probably wouldn't be as enthused about putting up a live Christmas tree anymore because it's just the two of us. Um, yeah, I can lump that. I can forget anything about we had a pre-lighted tree last year, artificial tree last year because other stuff was going on and he was the saddest guy you ever saw in your whole life because the first year he was here he had a live Christmas tree for the very first time and it snowed on Christmas day the first time he'd ever seen snow so we have been trying to match that level of sparkle ever since we haven't made it yet but we're still hopeful never happened um never happened but um so we, we have the live Christmas tree. As far as baking and stuff, fruitcake. I make fruitcake. I actually make pretty good fruitcake. Um, my grandmother used to have two fruitcake recipes. One was called dark fruitcake and was absolutely revolting. It was basically a homemade version of the Claxton one. But the great thing about it was you soaked it with liquor. You, start, you made it by Halloween and soaked it with liquor um, and stored it away until Christmas. It was still revolting. Uh, she always found one hidden fruitcake under the bed at Easter time every year. But the other fruitcake is called white fruitcake. It isn't white, it's brown, just like fruitcake, but it does have liquor. You eat it fresh. It's got the candied fruit in it and the nuts in it, but it doesn't have the dates and the molasses and that kind of stuff. And it's actually delicious. And we have that every year. And Lex makes a lot of stuff too. So. Cool, Crimson? Um we kind of do a bit of christmas and celebrate the solstice since um you know, i'm pagan and you know my husband is more used to christmas so um so we we decorate the tree which is we have a little you know like <laughs> two foot tree um mostly i don't bake so i pretty much make stuffing i make this you know two big trays of stuffing that we eat forever yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so, I mean, that's our decorating. We don't really do, do a lot of decorating, just the two of us. Um, and, and we're, you know, so far from home, most of all of our family is in Massachusetts. So, you know, um, it was always go, go, go for, for both of us where we'd always be traveling. So now it's nice just to be in one place. Um, but yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of our Christmas. Alexandra? Um, well, Lucy and I, of course, are siblings, so a lot of our traditions are similar. Um, Lucy makes this fruitcake, and like people in town are all, they were bugging her about this fruitcake, like September. I mean, are you gonna make a fruitcake? Are you gonna make a so it's like a big, it's like this big whole town deal now. Like she's famous for fruitcake or something. <laughs> no, she I'm used to make fruitcake. Well, she used to make our other grandmother's applesauce cake, which was way better because it's more cake and less fruit. But, you know, what do I know? Um, we'll do that this year. We're big fudge people in our family, too. We make a lot of fudge. We make a lot of fudge. And it's yes. kind of a science um, because it's actually the it's actually the recipe that's on the back of the um, jet puffed marshmallow cream jar. It's that recipe. But there are so many there are so many little protocols that you go that have that go with it like it's always better if you have a man to that can really get into the stirring um and then we've like come up with different variations on it like the one that we usually make is we don't put nuts in it we put peanut butter in it instead so it's chocolate peanut butter fudge that's, that's the good. best and um 
my father really liked the plain chocolate with nuts in it, which Lucy would always make that for him because I don't like nuts. I don't like nuts in things. I like nuts by themselves, but not in stuff. Um, and a couple of years ago, I decided that I wanted to make peppermint fudge. So my, I actually make some that is, it's white chocolate and it has candy canes in it. So it's, it's peppermint. Delicious. Um, and it's, it's pretty good. It's kind of a thick, chewy um, peppermint bark. It's the same kind of, the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm um now we also come from a really weird family so our traditions are really <laughs> odd like we uh my aunt Kathy is like the weirdest person alive and um, I hope that she eventually watches this so that she'll get to hear that she's the weirdest person alive but her and my and my uncle who passed away several years ago they used to send each other the weirdest stuff on Christmas and it was hilarious like one year um she sent him for Christmas a cartridge in a bear tree like it was a stick and it was like an empty bullet casing so it was a cartridge <laughs> in a pear tree bear tree and they thought that was hilarious um wasn't it, it, about wasn't the it sandwich. the tuna sandwich incident also oh, at christmas yeah when he was stationed in korea back in the 50s she was just a kid she was like 12 13 years old and when he had been at home his whole thing was you know cat go make me a sandwich and which drove her crazy. So for Christmas that year, she made him a tuna fish and peanut butter sandwich and wrapped it up and mailed it to Korea. Korea. Oh. So about March, oh. some poor mail guy for the US <laughs> Army opens up this box and finds the remains of this thing. So yeah, that, that's family legend, the, the first order. Yeah. Our family is very, very strange. I'm Everybody's not family is strange. Uh, but, but my husband and sometimes co-author Larry uh, is along with our middle daughter. So, so they'll bake the cookies and, and we got to decorate the cookies and all that. And one of the things that he found that everybody really liked is in Southern Living Cookbook. And it's this um, peppermint cake. And it's a red velvet cake with buttercream icing. And you're mm -hmm. supposed to use the little broken up peppermints all around it and, and um, all, all great. Well, the first year that our oldest daughter and her husband, it wasn't their rotation to come home for Christmas. They were gonna be with his family. She wanted to replicate all these dishes and she wanted to do the peppermint cake, but when she went to the store, they didn't have peppermint. So she said, mint is mint, let's get spearmint. Oh no! Oh, no. Hey, with <laughs> buttercream icing. It, it has gone down in family history. Their family, his, his, her husband's family history is the toothpaste cake. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's trying to be really polite. Um, so this is one of your family traditions, Jared. <laughs> you know? The good news is all of their sinuses were clear right up until New Year's. And they had minty fresh breath, yes. Yeah. Minty fresh breath. That's so, like those cookies. Those like those cookies. Remember those cookies that I tried to make, Jail or Lucy? Yes. Sorry, yes. I keep calling her by her name. It's okay. Um, it's okay. Yeah, um, I made these cookies. We were we were making. We decided we were going to make cookies, right? And of course, I'm like, I don't want the same cookies that we have every single freaking year. So I go in search of recipes, new and interesting recipes. So I found these peppermint cookies <laughs> that were supposed to be just delicious. These peppermint meltaways, I think is what they're called. Well, I don't know if I read the recipe wrong or if the recipe was wrong or if I just was heavy handed with the with the peppermint extract, but I put this peppermint extract in there and baked these cookies and they were beautiful. Well, I had already tasted what I knew that they were not good. My father, who always came in and whatever happened to be on the counter, he would just pick it up and start eating it. So he picks up one of these cookies, takes a bite, says not one word, he said, Damn. <laughs> Sit down and open the door. So yeah, I don't make those anymore. Well, and decorating wise, we are those people, we are that family. Um, so nice. we're not exactly, you know, um the uh movie the Chevy Chase movie level, but we're close, you know, we, we do a three-dimensional holiday otter outside as well as two <laughs> life size, you know, um, nutcrackers and a ton of lights on the, the bushes, but we do three full-size Christmas trees and they are all 
pre-lit trees, but you know, that's really the starter level. That's not right. the finish <laughs> level. So the, the big one, you know, it came pre-lit and then I put on roughly another 4,000 lights before we tried to <laughs> I'm not kidding. It really is about four or 5,000 lights. And my motto is that if you can't see it from space, you haven't done it right. right. So I go for about the wattage of a CarMax watt. And then it's just about right. So, yeah, we are those people. I love people that can do more than one Christmas tree. Like I was asking my coworker today, I was like, what is it with all these people doing three and four Christmas trees? I can barely get one up, usually the weekend before Christmas. <laughs> That's okay. I have to tell a, a Lex story about Christmas trees. The oh, first God. year that uh, Lex and Tally lived in the house they live in now, Lex put up a Christmas tree and apparently mom went over to see their Christmas tree and she comes home and she says, I'm going to use my real name. She says, JL, she says, I just don't know about Rachel using her real name. I said, what are you talking about? She, says, she has black garland on her Christmas tree. I said, well, it's her Christmas tree. I'm sure it's beautiful. She says, no, it's not beautiful. It's <laughs> <laughs> she said um, she said I am really concerned I said mother I said she doesn't have the devil she has black garland it's all right it will be okay if that's what she, I said it is beautiful I've seen it too I said but it, you know, it's just it's just I guess what, but was she more worried about the black tinsel on the tree, the black snowflakes on the tree, or the fact that I had a Buddha head on my mantle that I had put a Santa Claus hat on? <laughs> she hated that Buddha head with the passion of a thousand burning suns anyway. <laughs> she did. But... I'm surprised it didn't show up shattered after she died. Because, no. you know, I've never been able to find that black tinsel. <laughs> it's in my house somewhere. <laughs> Well, folks, we have come to the top of the hour. This has been so much fun. Let's uh, go around again and tell everybody if you've got something coming out for Christmas or if you got something on sale or something coming soon or you just have a holiday book you want to remind people about. Okay. Alexandra? I do not have a holiday book, unfortunately. I wish I did. Maybe my newspaper, my newspaper, my newsletter subscribers will get figgy pudding um, for <laughs> Christmas, perhaps but then they might think poorly of me. Uh, my latest release is a, uh, it's a seasonal book. It's a, it's a fall book. It's called Falling Into Rhythm and it takes place around about Halloween. It's for a, it's during a far, fall carnival and it's very Hallmark Channel movie-like. So, it's very, very um, good. But that's my most, that's my most recent thing. Okay, Crimson? Um, well, you can find me anywhere uh, by Googling Crimson Heart um, and I come up you know, Facebook, Instagram, wherever. Um, my latest book out is not a Christmas romance, but it is called uh, Serenaded by the Alien Vampire Rockstar because <laughs> it's fun to play with romance tropes and why not have fun with it? <laughs> cool. Lucy? Um, my latest release actually came out um back in the summer, but it does have a Christmas story in it. It's called The Passion of Miss Cuthbert. It is a Stella Hart mystery. It takes place on a cruise ship. Uh, Stella is with her fiance on the cruise ship, thinking that they're finally gonna get to be alone, but then people start dropping dead and she has to solve murders. And that and is available everywhere. How about you, Kim? So I'm Kay Fielding writes all over on, on my, my on the web on facebook on twitter on instagram on all the social media stuff and my next book is out december 29th it's called teddy spencer isn't looking for love and it's a it's a, a sort of a fluffy rom-com it actually has a, a valentine's day theme it's very tropey it's got a workplace romance and forced proximity oh no there's only one bed and it was super <laughs> fun to write so that's that's so cool um, I mentioned mine already, um, but I do have a new one coming out in my Kings of the Mountain universe uh, just after the first of the year. It'll still be a Christmas uh, themed story. I'm, I'm in a big multi-author uh, short original short story giveaway on prolific works. And uh, that one's going to be called a Christmas, The Christmas Spirit. And like I said, it's the Kings of the Mountain uh, universe. So we'll get to see a little more of Dawson and Grady. Thanks. And I'm findable everywhere as Gail Z. Martin and Morgan Bryce. You put those in, I'm going to come up as long as you spell them right and use the Z. 
<laughs> uh, well, folks, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And thank you for watching us. Please uh, hang in there with us on Continue. We've got a lot more great holiday uh, programming coming up and a lot more holiday romance. So stick with us and uh, got a lot of things coming up you're going to want to see. Thank you so much for watching us and we'll see you online.